So, hello, my name is uh, David Saale. I'm uh, one of the partners at BIG. Uh, BIG is an architecture company which has a headquarter in Copenhagen, where I'm situated. Um, can you hear me, actually? Every can everybody hear me also in the back? Okay. Because then, uh, then I'll just uh, speak uh, loud. Loud and uh, with the good uh, acoustics that are in here, I think it's, uh, it's perfect. We, are, um, we have a headquarter in Copenhagen with uh, 170 uh, architects and uh, another headquarter in uh, New York. I'm gonna do this. Where we have, uh, where we started uh, six years ago with a project um, where we in was invited to do a housing project on Manhattan, moved over there with three people, and now we are 100, 190 people uh, in that office. Uh, we just finished that project, so this is our first building in uh, New York. It's uh, called uh, the Via Building. It's basically a, um, a mixture between a European courtyard building and a skyscraper. Uh, it contains a big courtyard for the for the social public of people that, that lives in the building, and is in one corner uh, high as a handrail, and in the other end high as a as a high rise. Which gives everybody a fantastic view of the Hudson River, which is uh, right in front of it. Uh, basically, it's it's a design that does something that we very often uh, try to do, which is basically to mix two things that are each other's opposites and that have um, you could say values that we want to uh, maintain, but that normally gets separated. Here, it's the density and the uh, you could say the the public. Um, base of the skyscraper you know, on Manhattan, and then the European way of building, building cities, which is basically uh, courtyard buildings uh, stacked next to each other, uh, both as you have uh, in, in Vienna, uh, in Copenhagen, and, and in most European cities, combined into something that we call the court scraper, which is basically uh, an um, unlikely marriage between inherent opposite uh, values. Um, Leaving New York, I want to uh, show you uh, a couple of uh, museums that we are either designing right now or museums that have been designed within the last couple of years. The first one is in Elsinger. It's a maritime museum. It's situated in a, a very um, in a city that is very bound to its maritime history. Uh, it's situated inside an old shipyard dock that was decommissioned. Uh, 20 years ago. Uh, the city is very closely linked to the maritime history, both because it was part of the, the industry there. Uh, 3,000 people worked on the factory. Everybody in the city knew somebody that worked there or had a family that worked there. Uh, the old dock was uh, torn down in the 50s. A new one was constructed uh, and it built a lot of uh, ships um, and in that way was part of the maritime history. As you can see here, the harbor was extremely filled with, uh, with industry and the other part of the harbor uh, is filled with one of the only three UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Denmark, uh, Kronborg Castle, uh, the home of Hamlet. Uh, and back in year 2000, uh, Kronborg was named UNESCO World Heritage and UNESCO gave two challenges to Kronborg in order to uh, keep this, uh, this uh, very uh, prestigious um, uh, you could say name for, for being part of the UNESCO World Heritage. One of them was to clean their business case, which means they had to throw out all the functions that had nothing to do with the history of the building. So the Maritime Museum, which has been situated for 100 years on the first floor, was thrown out. And the other one was to basically reconstruct the way the castle looked in the 15th century. So back then it was uh, the, one of the most powerful castles in Denmark because it, it uh, claimed the, the toll in order for ships to go into the Baltic region. Uh, so then around uh, the industrialization when that happened there was no toll anymore but the industry took over and then in around 25 years ago the entire factory shut down and lift, uh, among other, this old dock. We came for the, for the competition and it was completely filled with water. 
So we couldn't even see the space that we were supposed to design within. And when we read the brief, it was very clear that UNESCO had claimed the 500 meters radius around the castle where we could not build as much as a meter out of the ground. So we had to basically just put a lid onto the dock, cut some skylights, but constantly maintain the view to the old historical castle. But between the lines in the program, we read what they really wanted, which was, of course, a Guggenheim in the hole. Basically to create attention, attract more people to come to their museum. And the question for us was then, how do you create an invisible icon? So we, uh, we started working with, uh, with the dock, and one of the things that was very obvious, it hadn't been emptied for 20 years with water, but it was an, an industrial uh, complex. So it wasn't insulated, and we were uh, quite sure that when we emptied it, water would leak in from all sides. So the first thing that we had to do was basically to insulate it on the inside, which we thought was quite um, a quite counterintuitive thing to do because the reason why the museum wanted to move into the dock was because they wanted to preserve the history of the old concrete. They wanted to be able to see the textures of the wall and live within history, so to speak. And we then started to look into different uh, technical options uh, of how we could actually insulate it from the outside. And we found out the only way to do that was basically to build a new wall all the way around the dock, dig it out, pump it clear of water, insulate it on the outside, fill it up with earth, put on the, 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 the urban uh, area around it, and by doing that, we could then have a nice texture on the wall which we thought was quite a lot of work in order just to basically change the color of, of the wall inside the museum. So we thought, okay, if we anyway have to dig all the way around the old uh, historical dock, why not put the museum out there and actually liberate the dock from functionality and make the dock the iconic structure. So basically, we dug around and it was more like an... Um, archaeologist uh, digging its way around uh, an old historical relic to preserve it. So the museum in a way became the, the, the new museum became the, uh, the exhibition box around uh, the biggest exhibition piece within the museum, namely a 150 meter long concrete dock, 20 meters wide and 8 meters tall that is now standing there today. So basically it was uh, the museum became the vehicle for uh, the preservation of the dock itself. Uh, in a way, we could say we, we basically turned the program inside out. Instead of putting all the functionality in the dock, we, uh, we wrapped it around it and then connected it with three bridges. The three bridges are in the middle. There's a, a main entrance bridge to the Kronborg Castle. It's called the Kronborg Bridge. Along the harbor front, there was, in the local plan, a need for an 8 meter promenade and for a connection for the, for the fire trucks to go out to Kronborg. Um, and then the only thing that we actually added was then the main entrance. And the main entrance we call the, the zigzag bridge, the museum entrance, and it's tilting 1 to 25, which in, in Danish uh, uh, law is the, the tilt that is, is uh, allowed for, for people in, um, in wheelchairs. So basically underneath these bridges you then enter and the museum on the inside is then connected via uh, the functions that either need light, daylight into the museum or needs um, to be visible from the urban uh, situation around it. The, the middle, the Kronborg Bridge underneath it has uh, the auditorium and the entire museum then becomes, you could say, the, the historical uh, uh, celebration of the maritime. So there's a, there's a link between, you could say, the content of the museum and the frame of the museum. And in many ways, for us, um, it's really important that uh, the reason why a building looks different is not because of 
aesthetic reasons. It's not because the architect wants something different. It's because it actually performs in a different way. It actually creates uh, value either for the people visiting it, for the people living in it, for the city around it. And in that way, architecture becomes a vehicle for, uh, for change. The museum was even built on a ship uh, yard um, uh, in China and transported on a, on a, a Danish uh, boat to Denmark and then lifted on place in 100 tons big uh, steel pieces. Uh, and, and the dock itself then becomes the biggest and most uh, flexible outdoor exhibition uh, space or event space in the middle uh, of the city. The next project I'm going to show you is uh, the Danish Expo Pavilion, which was in 2010 in Shanghai. Uh, the theme was sustainability, and it was uh, basically the assignment to say how can you uh, experience sustainability. One of the problems often about expos is that you spend most of the time waiting in line around an hour between, before you go into the museum, then you spend 10 minutes running through it, and then half an hour going to the next one. So we thought, okay, how can we actually not only look at the building, but actually at how you experience it, because you're spending so little time there. So we didn't want any text, we basically wanted real experience of how Denmark is to visit if you look at it from a sustainable point of view. So we thought, okay, this is how streets used to look in, in China, filled with bicycles. That's no longer how they are. That's how they were in my childhood when I was uh, uh, getting history lessons and, and uh, cultural lessons about uh, China. Now, it's actually all cars. In, in Shanghai, there's even a law against uh, bicycling on the streets. And they have the world record of traffic jams. It took four days. And their theme was better city, better life. And, and that must be an example of the exactly opposite of a city you would want to live in. Um, you don't know whether you're going to work or back from work. So basically in Copenhagen, 40% of the people commute to work on bicycles. So we took a thousand Copenhagen free bikes and basically designed the pavilion as a bicycle street. The bicycles are on the roof. You bicycle both inside and outside on the pavilion. The division between the uh, pedestrians and the bicycles is a 200 meter long uh, bench that uh, uh, is uh, designed together with an artist as an experience piece where you can uh, sit and experience uh, different uh, films and videos done also by artists that focus on the themes that we would like to uh, uh, tell about how sustainable Denmark is uh, to, to live in. And then another sustainable thing that I think you also have here in Vienna is that the harbor is now so clean you can swim in it which is definitely not the case in Shanghai, even though it's a harbor city. So we basically exported that as the heart of the pavilion, a real experience of being able to jump into clean water in the hot Chinese summer uh, and do a swim around the Little Mermaid, the real Little Mermaid, which we then proposed to move to China for, for eight months. Uh, she, uh, we had to take it uh, through the parliament because the Danish National uh, Party didn't want us to, to remove her out of the Copenhagen Harbor. Uh, so it was back in 2009, and from 9 to 11, they debated uh, the bank package of how to save uh, the Danish economy after the world crisis. And from 11 to 1, they debated whether we could remove the Little Mermaid uh, out of the Copenhagen Harbor and, and ship her off to, uh, to China, which luckily uh, we were allowed to do. Um, and um, she was then flown, including stone, all the way to, uh, to China. Spent 14 days in customs. I don't know what the Chinese were looking for, but luckily uh, they did not find it. Uh, so, so she ended up uh, in the middle of, uh, of, the, of the pavilion. And we then did an exchange with the Ai Weiwei that uh, set up a, a small surveillance camera that was the exact copy of the, of the camera that surveilled his own house, which was the only live feed because the pavilion is Danish soil while the expo lasts, so we actually were allowed to have a live feed uh, out of China as one of the only uh, video live feeds uh, straight out of, uh, of the country, uh, which was then uh, 
screened on the place where the Little Mermaid was normally situated in the harbor so that if uh, tourists came by and wanted to see her, they could still see that she was doing okay, okay now just uh, in China. I can see I've uh, run out of time, so uh, I will uh, I will only stick to these two projects, and uh, maybe in the discussion I can come in on the on the third one. <laughs>